energy efficiency basis. So as Jose said, um, my name is Sally Godber and uh, I've got this consultancy that me and my dad set up about 12 years ago and it's still going and we do two things. We kind of basically, we're like the, um, the grout for projects where whatever the bits of knowledge that they don't have, we try and fill in all of that. So we do lots of um, stuff, but predominantly in the UK and with the UK construction industry. And that's predominantly because, uh, yeah, they really need to upskill in terms of, of uh, quality and both from a design perspective and also in terms of the construction and because of that uh, we set up a separate company which is a not-for-profit called Coaction, which is all about training and um, there are four courses that we offer at the moment um, the main one is the certified passive house designer course and this is very much about the um, kind of teaching from practitioners perspective but today I'm going to give you some insights from the passive house bite size course that we do which is kind of for designers but it's a bit of a lighter course than the full designer there's no calculations in there and whatever else um, it's worthwhile saying that I'm going to whiz through this fairly quickly. If it was actually the full course, we'd obviously be going into like loads of detail about it. In terms of the content I'm going to provide, uh, these are our lovely trainers that are all professionals within the UK that come from different parts of the industry. And that's what's so magical about the way that we teach is having this kind of big melting pot of different people's ideas. So none of it's mine. I've stolen it all. And here we go. Let's have a go. So there's three things I'm going to talk about today just to keep it kind of super snappy. Um, and these are all things that you don't necessarily need to get sign off from the client. You can do um, irrespective of whether it's a passive house or not. It's completely applicable to every project. And there's still bits of this that I'm still learning. So the three things I'm going to talk to you about is hopefully kind of um, busting some of those myths, particularly around Passive House. So the first one is stop obsessing about form factor. And I'm going to talk to you about what that is in a minute, just in case you don't know. Then um, Passive Solar is an absolute disgrace and we need to stop doing that. And then lastly, heat pumps, particularly air source heat pumps are absolutely appalling and we need to rethink those completely. So let's get started. So stop obsessing over form factor. This is something that for our passive house projects, we get an awful lot of this where people are just like, ah, I've got this, you know, I need to improve this slightly. So what is it? For those of you that haven't come across this before, I'd be kind of surprised within the passive house community, but it's basically, it's a kind of metric to give us an understanding about how efficient the design is, um, because ultimately the heat loss of our building is a function of the amount of surface area. So the amount of walls, the amount of roof, the amount of floor. So what we can say is we can apply this efficiency by saying the amount of that surface area divided by the treated floor area. So the heat loss area is the thing that we have to pay for. The more heat loss area we have, the more heat loss of the building. Uh, the treated floor area is the thing that we want out of it at the end of the day. So this is saying how much you have to pay for to get the thing that you want, okay? So less lower form heat loss factor means less insulation to meet the passive house standard or to achieve any other kind of particular standard. So roughly speaking, we've got a kind of range of buildings here with the form heat loss factor along the side and just picking one at random. So the one in the middle that's got a form heat loss factor of two, that means for every meter square of kind of floor area in the building, that means there are two meters squared of either wall, roof or floor that we need to pay for to compensate for that the heat loss from it. And why is this important? Well, roughly for the UK and for kind of the majority of the, um, I forgot what the climate region is called, but kind of um, not cold, not super cold, but kind of um, still need some heating, then we need to roughly, there's a kind of rough indication that we need somewhere in the region for a form factor of two, then we need about 200 mil of insulation. I'm talking about mineral wool insulation, nice squidgy stuff, nothing super techy. And obviously we still need to put all the, um, the, uh, the structure of the building and all the cladding and all of those other things. So this is just the insulation. So you can see that actually, if we've got a form heat loss factor of four, so some kind of wacky little bungalow somewhere, we're going to have to put an absolute shed load of insulation on this. Now, you know, everyone likes to cling on to something numeric. It's really easy to tell whether you're doing good or bad. So it's kind of people do tend to obsess about this. But where is that leading us? Ultimately, are we going to end up in this position here where we've got like this one mega block? Are we going to absolutely um, do we need to just stop building low rise housing altogether and just go for mega uh, buildings like this is that the solution because ultimately this is the most efficient it's got the best form heat loss factor 
Has anyone got a problem with that? You're kind of happy to move out from your houses and go into this? Well, there's all kinds of um, social problems that this kind of thing creates. Um, so it's really not ideal, um, this kind of um, extremities. There's other problems in terms of the energy of uh, pumping it, the fire problems. Uh, and as I said, the social stuff, not having access to daylight, all of these things are really critical for us in terms of um, having buildings that we enjoy being in and give us pleasure. So there's definitely a kind of gremlins down the bottom end. We do not need to be going there. And ultimately, the form heat loss factor is a really helpful tool to give us an indication about how much insulation we're going to need, how efficient our building is going to be. But it's not the end thing. It's not the most crucial thing when it comes to building design. That is all about complexity. So we've got two projects here, which are both quite massive and the form heat loss factor isn't that bad. But what is absolutely appalling is the level of complexity that we've uh, put in here. Now, this lovely quote from one of our trainers, you get four corners for free, everything else you have to pay for. Corners are a real problem for building anyway, because it's really hard for us to work out how to program for it. It's really hard for us to do the quality control on it. It's likely the bits where um, materials need cuts and we have wastage. So in terms of our embodied energy, they're not great. It's all the bits that are kind of difficult, kind of getting the tolerances of things fitting together. And then we get onto the things that we care about in terms of building performance. So air tightness is always a problem when we get to corners. It's never the flat bits of walls that are the issue and insulation continuity again really problematic now i'm going to show you an example of a really prob uh, really difficult project now looking at this i mean would you say that that was terribly complex well no not really it's kind of it's a terrace of 15 homes they're all um, it's one big block so again kind of a pretty good form heat loss factor not looking all that bad but there's some really complicated details here so this uh, is the bay window and you can see to create that lovely bay what we've had to do is there's a whole load of secondary steel work in there to uh, that is uh, that we need to keep the structure up to keep the uh, cladding of the material up and to then we've got this tiny little gap between that uh, the, uh, the structural steel that we have to insulate and it becomes really difficult to do a good job. And you can see down at the bottom there where they're trying to insulate around the bolt heads and all kinds of horrid stuff. I mean, this all had to be ripped up and they had to do it again. So again, in terms of um, the quality control, just really difficult to keep on top of this and being asked to do a really difficult job trying to insulate around these very complicated shapes. And ultimately, it's really easy for things to be covered up. So the likelihood of the performance gap slipping in with these kind of things is very tricky. I mean, here we've got like a wind strut that uh, they're trying to insulate around. I mean, this stuff is mental. Like, why are we designing like this? Now, complexity, What I, when I talk about complexity, what I'm interested in is the thermal envelope. So not necessarily what you see on the outside. So here we've got two blocks. They're actually on the same estate. They're pretty similar. They're both passive house buildings. But which is more complicated? It's pretty hard to tell from the outside. For that, we need to understand something about the thermal um, envelope. And you can start to kind of pick apart where you think it might be. So let's have a look at what they look like. So the one... Um, on the, oh, I'm really bad at left and right. The one on the left hand side has got all these inset balconies, which makes the shape incredibly complicated. And the number of corners that we come back to, huge number there, very, very difficult. This took about six attempts to get the air test uh, result that they needed on this project. Whereas the one on the right, whilst it's got all these balconies on the outside that make it look really complicated, the thermal envelope is actually incredibly simple. So it's not always obvious from the outside and we need to kind of pull it apart to get the most out of it. And here's a really lovely um, example of a bungalow, which, as I said, would typically be really problematic in terms of meeting the passive house standard. But it's a great example of doing things super simply. So this is a project, a self-build project by George Merklick um, called Old Holloway. He's got a lovely blog about this. And this was actually built out of straw bales. And he made this work because he got the details so simple and there was so little to go wrong. So in terms of form factor, 
it is helpful, particularly when we get to onto kind of very low rise buildings and it's kind of a useful tool for us and a useful metric, but really it's not what we should be looking at. Making things simple for all building types is always the thing that's going to have the biggest Im impact on the overall performance of the building and also um, particularly when we don't necessarily for projects sometimes you don't have all that much control over the construction and those stages you may have quite a little um, limited um, uh, scope in those cases making it simple gives you a much better chance of, of it working and then it's hard you know complexity creeps in everywhere so this is a kind of classic picture of some air tightness here on a project that we're working on which looked like super simple from the outside and then you go to site and you see what they've had to do to make, get this internal floor in and it just it makes you want to cry so this is like a life's piece of work you have to get things simpler right next up passive solar design this is an absolute abomination we need to stop doing this so this kind of things neither of these are passive house they're just stuff that i googled of kind of pictures of passive solar but this kind of thing has been an inherent part of passive house i mean passive it's all been uh, kind of a real driver in terms of um, solar gain being a really crucial part of what we should be looking for and offsetting the heating okay so kind of pictures like this where we've got the uh, the sun coming in through the window windows and that's one of the benefits please just stop doing this what this leads to is uh buildings that look like this so this is a school that we're involved with this is a south facing window you can see that we've got glass all the way from the floor all the way up to the soffit of uh, the room in that, this case so loads of glass and this was kind of seen as a real benefit you know we're getting loads of solar gain in but what actually this resulted in was this. So this is a thermographic image taken during the summer. And what happened in this particular building was we were getting complaints that it was very uncomfortably hot. Now, in this particular case, the blinds are down. There also is a massive overhang on this particular building as well. And the air temperature, they were saying it's really hot. It's really stuffy. We think the ventilation is broken. We need some cooling in here. And the air temperature was actually pretty OK at 23 degrees. So we'd consider that acceptable. But what was happening, because the sun was coming down and hitting the glass, it was heating it up. And you can see on this spot here, it's up at 42 degrees, which is really hot. That's like the temperature of a radiator. So whilst the air temperature was totally fine, the radiant from this glass was almost impossible. And there's really not very much you can do about this at all. So this is what the school did in terms of retrofitting it. They've got the blinds down. They've got these external shades to try and reduce the amount of solar gain coming in in the winter to, in the summertime. This is an absolute disaster. Now we have to be we obviously have to move on from this and have to put less glass on our buildings. But how much is enough? And particularly when we've got buildings which are um, uh, have got quite thick insulation, we have to be very careful about judging the amount of glass from the outside. So here you'd say that this was quite a modestly glazed building. But once you step inside, you can see that the glazing is actually really quite significant. We need to be designing glazing from the inside to provide daylighting and connection to outside only and no more. OK. But doesn't it have a big impact on our heating energy? Well, let's take a look. So here we've got a, uh, a single room with a window on two aspects of it. And what I'm doing is I'm taking that uh, room and I'm spinning it around. OK. And so to start with, uh, the windows are on the north and the south, and then I spin it round so they go to the east and the west, and then back all the way round to the north and south. And let's have a look what happens during the summertime. Well, what we can see is that whilst in the winter, um, when the uh, windows are on the south and the north, the solar gain is actually relatively low, we get a big difference as it swings round towards the summer, and then it goes back down again during the winter. But in terms of the winter solar gains, what happens is they're relatively flat. There's not a huge amount of difference from summertime to winter. So what this tells us is that we do need to be careful about orientation. But the reason why we want to be careful about orientation is to avoid summer overheating. So it's much easier if we've got a building that's facing north and south to design it so that we don't have an overheating problem. But in terms of winter time, it's really not a thing. We should not be worried about that at all. 
So in terms of our, just to conclude on this one, uh, glazing is it's gold dust. It's like the magic that we put on our building that gives us that connection to outside. And we really need to see our window design kind of shown in that light. This is really special. We need to be very careful about the way we design it, making sure we get the most out of the daylight, but not just uh, kind of slapping it on everywhere and particularly not adorning our buildings with it. There we go. So not adorning. Yeah, brilliant. That's the one. Right. Lastly, heat pumps, they're rubbish. This is what we're putting in everywhere. So why are they rubbish? What's going on? Well, let me tell you a little story. Here we've got um, the uh, a kind of a traditional, typical heat pump install. And um, I've got a graph I'm gonna show to you, which is um, relates the coefficient of performance. So the coefficient of performance, if you don't know, is about how well, um, how efficient the heat pump works. So if you have a coefficient of performance of three, say, that means for every unit of electricity that we put in, we get three units of heat out of it. OK, so a big number is a good thing and a low number is a bad thing. And roughly speaking, that we want to have definitely a coefficient of a performance above three and preferably knocking on the kind of four or five is what we're aiming at. So a traditional um, heat pump might have a graph that looks something like this. So we've got the temperature along the bottom and the coefficient of performance up the side. And what you can see is that there's a really big influence on the coefficient of performance based on the flow temperature. So how hard is that heat pump having to work? The more the, the higher the temperature, the harder the heat pump is having to work and the poorer the performance. So for example, if we've got a flow temperature of 65 C, then we're going to end up with a coefficient of performance somewhere around about two and a half. OK, in comparison, if we have a flow temperature of 40 degrees C, then we're going to have a coefficient performance of four. So this means for our designing our buildings, we need for our heat pumps to work efficiently. We need to be getting that flow temperature down. We need them to be only um, trying to achieve low temperature flows for what we're um, for the majority of our heating situations. Now, obviously, this graph is just for one specific location. And if you're somewhere that's much cooler, then it's going to have to be working harder. If you're somewhere that's warmer, then it's not having to work so hard. But this is just one kind of particular case and one particular unit as well. So looking at its particular performance, it, the graphs will tend to be um, will vary depending on those other characteristics as well. But in terms of um, these, this is one of the most crucial things that we can do. So how do we actually do this? How do we get a uh, low flow temperature? temperatures for our heating systems. Well, typically in the UK, we would typically have a flow temperature of 70 degrees C as what is kind of fairly standard. And we might have for that our radiators might have an output of say two kilowatts. If we turn the flow temperature down to 40 degrees C, then what happens is the output of those radiators drop. OK, they still can provide some output, but instead of the two kilowatts, we're now getting 0.8 of a kilowatt out of it. So to get back up to the, our two kilowatts, which is what our heat, our building might require, we need to add in more radiators. OK, so it's quite simple. And this is about the system design. This is nothing to do with the building design whatsoever. The other issue that we quite often come about come across is a situation like this. So we've got a heat pump um, and it's uh, then serving a heating system. And that heating system we might have designed with our uh, more radiators in it so that our flow temperature was nice and low at 40 degrees C. So it's delivering that 40 degrees C water lovely and efficiently and working really well. Now, often what happens is at this point, people start adding on other bits to it. And particularly like a hot water system is quite common to add on to it. Now, this is where start, it, stuff starts to get really crazy and I start kind of pulling my hair out. At this point, hot water, we don't want that at 40 degrees C. We want it to be delivered much hotter than that. So typically like 60. Now to do that, it means that the whole of the rest of the system has to be running at 60 degrees C. And it means our heat pump is now having to deliver water at 65 or even higher to achieve that 60 degrees C at our taps. And the other part of this is it's not running, the hot water system is running throughout the year. So we end up with this situation where our lovely, well-designed heating system, we're not getting the benefit of those low temperatures. 
Now, if you want to know more about heat pumps, as well as the information that we've got, uh, the, the training that we've got within Coaction and the um, bite size course there, there's also a really fantastic course created by Heat Geek. If you're a services engineer and you want more information on that, and um, we've just compiled a short um, uh, primer for heat pumps, which will be coming out shortly through the Passive House Trust. So heat pumps are rubbish. Well, they're not, but they definitely need a bit more care and attention in terms of the design. Predominantly, they need low flow temperatures, and they also need us to separate out the, the different um, ways that we're delivering heat to different. So they need us to, um, to separate out the different requirements so that we can deliver each one as efficiently as possible. So in terms of conclusion, the first one, stop obsessing over form factor. Yeah, it's complexity. That's the thing that we really need to worry about to get the best out of our buildings. Passive solar definitely needs to design. Uh, we need to be careful about that. And it's daylight and summer comfort only from here on out. And heat pumps are pretty rubbish unless you get that flow temperature down. Um, I'd just like to say thank you and conclude with uh, if anyone's got any more questions or want to do any more training, then uh, please go and have a look at our co-action website. That's it. Thanks, guys. That was awesome. I feel like I learned all kinds of new things, but it's like you kind of mentioned, it's basic enough that it's almost intuitive, right? Just to be able to question yourself uh, and the things that you know. So thank you, Sally. That was awesome. Um, I know we have a couple of questions and I'm eager to get to them, but first I would love to um, be able to say some thanks to the sponsors. Thank you very much, Sarah. And yeah, we have room for a few more questions. So um, make sure to add them to the chat if you have something you'd like to ask Sally. Uh, quickly, we'd like to thank our sponsors. They make everything that we do at the Accelerator possible, starting with our stakeholder sponsor, NYSERDA. Our founding sponsors are 475 High Performance Building Supply, Glavel, Foam Glass Gravel, Ingui Architecture, Minotaur All-in-One uh, Box HVAC D Units, Partel, Rockwell North America, Stocorp, Zola Windows and Doors, and our champion sponsors, Boviso, Gradient, Icon Windows and Doors, Intelligent Membranes, PH Air Seal, Prosico, and Source 2050. So back over to you, Sarah and Jose. Thank you, Kim, uh, and thank you, sponsors. So we'll um we'll move into the Q and A, and I think our first question is from our good uh, very own Sarah. Go ahead. Yeah, um, I just wanted to ask you, Sally, regarding the windows and the glazing. Where does triple pane fit into that? Oh, so we're I'm assuming um the example I gave was a passive house primary school um, and we've had this come up so this is kind of irrespective the issue about um, radiant discomfort is um, the the performance of the glazing doesn't make a huge difference to that um, mm. so I would say this is what so I guess what was so surprising to us was that the um, the monitoring. So we've had this same thing come up on in that case of school, but also in terms of um, housing as well, is um, that the radiant discomfort is not in the UK. It's not something which is commonly uh, modeled. It's very difficult to explain to designers that this is a problem. And it was a real surprise to us too. Now, it may be that in other climates, this is something which is um, more understood and is uh, taken into consideration. But this is kind of, there's not really a way of specifying your way out of this. It's just mm -hmm. that if you, um, as our experience is the average of the temperatures around us and so having some hot temperatures um, and having a lot of glass means that it is not it is just going to be uncomfortable and going back to the kind of fanger equations of comfort and looking at, at you have to really pull the air temperature right down um, so it requires an awful lot of cooling to get to a point where it feels comfortable to sit with that hot temperature so thinking about kind of the example of um like a um, out uh, outside on a cold night and having a fire and the radiant of the fire is you need the air temperature to be able to stand near the fire you need the air temperature to be really cold for it to feel comfortable right okay great thank you
Uh, up next, it's uh, Marianne Sorensen. Is she on? Marianne Sorensen Alachi. I hope I said that right. Um, I think she's not on, so I can, I can, it's more of a yes. clarification. Oh, is she on? Okay, go ahead. Hi, thank you. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, I was just a little bit confused and just clarification. So, um, the question that I asked was that the lower the temperature, um, the harder the outside temperature, the harder the heat pump works. Correct. I, I got a little bit confused with the oh, way. Oh, that... yeah. So I know someone's put in the notes about um about the mainly using air to air heat pumps, and I should have been clear about that. This is probably I'm hoping this will answer you, Marianne. But the majority of what um we're looking at in and this particular case that I was uh, explaining is where we have air to water. Oh. So we're going in this case. If I just show you, so in this particular case here. Um, we have got uh, the the temperatures at the bottom here. These represent the flow temperatures um, of the water that the heat pump is trying to um, deal with. Now, obviously, if you're doing air to air, there is that's an awful lot more efficient because you don't have that um, the heat exchanger between the uh, refrigerant cycle and your heating system in your building. And mm -hmm. so we already we have that inefficiency in there and then we're trying to heat it up really hot. So having to make it work really hot in comparison, if you're trying to bring it up to an air temperature of like 20, then obviously the heat pump is going to be able to do an awful lot better out of it or it should do. Was that your question? Does it yes, make sense? yes, it was. Uh, I should have said that. That's really, it's really good to, this is the first time I've presented this actually like this. So it's good to get that feedback. And yeah, I'll definitely make that clearer. Very, it was really helpful and concise. And you move through it and you hit a lot of information. So it was really, <laughs> very helpful. Thank you. Well, it's great doing it to an international audience. So I'm really interested to hear what is different and kind of what people find as um doesn't work for them as well like I know so yeah it's been uh, really useful as we said we're kind of basically we're in the UK so uh, yeah really interested in hearing other people's perspectives. So Sally it kind of sounds like you um, made it might have touched on this a little bit um, Vincent had asked a question and Vincent I'm gonna go ahead and just reiterate it for you um, but that was whether or not the issue was with heat pumps that are air to air or if it is simply kind of the water one that you just talked about and it kind of sounds like it's the latter yes it's um the that is pretty much all the the particular issues that we're having so what we're finding in the uk and um throughout quite a bit of europe too is that um service engineers are not used to dealing with this we have a really um really inexperienced uh team that are kind of working on these things tend to be so they're taking off their traditional gas boiler, which would be serving a radiator circuit or underfloor or whatever else. And they're just unplugging that in mentally and they're putting in this heat pump instead. And so we end up with these very high, um, all the characteristics which suit a boiler really fine, but are really awful in terms of heat pumps. Uh, so I think this is probably a specific issue um, for us and us trying to just give the services engineers a good shake and getting them to think about something else. Um, so the um David, I was I just saw your um comments up there. I mean the the I've shown the schematic I showed on there um with a buffer vessel. Um I probably should have simplified that and got rid of it. This is something that we we're also trying to get rid of buffer vessels as much as we can, because ideally they're just kind of dribbling heat out into the building. So this is kind of it's a, on some situations because heat pumps aren't very good at modulating, uh, particularly commercial heat pumps are pretty awful at it. I don't know why they just have there's very few of them that have got good inverter driven pumps. 
um, and often the load profile of the building can be uh, can dribble down to kind of very little if they're large buildings so it can kind of the difference between the maximum and the minimum what it's got to try and achieve is really really difficult for it to do that so that's the one case where a buffer vessel might be worthwhile but we would always question it and we'd always try and make it as small as we technically can as well but the main thing is what I'm saying here is when we have an air to water system is trying to separate these things out. So having a separate heat pump system that would be dealing with the hot water and then a separate one that deals with the heating. And then we can have the high temperature one that deals with the hot water and choose a heat pump that's good at high temperature stuff and really get the efficiency out of our heating circuit. Can I quickly jump in? Yeah. I, uh, yeah, I'm here in Canada, and I just recently had an air-to-air -air heat pump installed. Um, I'll mention that uh, hot water is not part of it, so it's separate from it. Um, interestingly enough, switching from a conventional gas, um, gas to air was what we do here, forced air heating. Um, the, the main difference that I've noticed is that we it doesn't lift the temperature quite as high, so it runs longer. Um, with um, with the energy being put into the air. And the interesting thing is that um, it makes it feel a little bit un uh, more uncomfortable because you're actually pushing colder air around. So it feels a little bit more drafty, even though it's putting the, the energy in. I'm, I'm not sure about the um, coefficient um, on those units, but I was under the assumption that they're not too bad in this case. So I hope uh, that on the long term, it turns out to be a good decision. Oh, that's it's, really interesting it's, feedback. It's also, yeah, nice one. Yeah, it's also not a passive house that I live in. Um, it's pretty efficient, um, but yeah, it needs more um, energy to be put into the air. Yeah, I think the... <laughs> as a in comparison to gas boilers are amazing at modulating and it doesn't really matter what size you get uh like it, if you oversize a gas boiler it doesn't really matter but oversizing a heat pump means that it's going to run at a pretty poor efficiency or it's going to be running at kind of um yeah the modulation is not so good so it may be to do with the sizing of it but yeah it's really interesting hearing you say that i know um for some of the passive house buildings that we've done which have got air to air heat pumps they haven't had that particular problem um but yeah it's uh, it, there's still an awful lot that we're learning Thanks. Well, this is a very interesting topic, and I think it's taking over the, the 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 full presentation. But I think it's really important to clarify those things. Um, I I have only experience, I guess, with air to air heat pumps in the uh, multifamily projects I've worked on in, in New York City, and I am still learning about it. I mean, I don't have any mechanical background, so to me, this is I need to go out now and watch a lot of YouTube videos on explaining the difference between both of them uh to really get it right but i wonder before we go to the next question how does this apply the air to air or air to water heat pump if you're doing an all electric building or you're trying to switch to all electric and you replace or eliminate the gas that you may have at the moment is that a complicated transition because now everything is going to electric or you know most advanced uh buildings are trying to go all electric so that's that's something I guess it's also relevant to kind of shoot into the conversation. Yeah, I like it. I like it. So Jose, is this um I wasn't sure if this was a question you were asking or on behalf of someone else, but I'm I would like to know if this is for um is this like for a new building that's being planned or a retrofit? Oh, I'm 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 just free free balling here. I'm just Curious. thinking yeah, out yeah, loud okay, before that's we cool. go to the next so question. Yeah. In this particular so um I mean in whether it's an air to air or whether it's an air to water, like the example, I've got the schematic on the screen here. Um, that's all driven by um, electricity. So there's no gas involved in any of these systems, which is definitely where we want to be going. We electrify everything. We're totally on board with that. We just need to do it well. Now, one of the most um, so the um, the crucial things with the air to water is if we have an existing building 
then it comes back to uh, what I was discussing about uh, making sure that your radiators or underfloor heating or whatever you've got is big enough. And it may be that particularly for retrofit cases that you want to add on more additional radiators. Now, if you're also doing a retrofit to reduce the heating energy, that it may be that actually that you've gone from one kilo, two kilowatts to start with and that you go down to 0.8 kilowatts and actually that's enough and you don't need to increase the radiators but getting the if you are doing a retrofit then getting your heat pump to work efficiently is the most crucial thing you know kind of it's um we have to be realistic we're definitely in the uk we have no significant policies to do like whole um uk wide retrofit whatsoever and uh but we do have some policies to implement more heat pumps and i would say that we've really changed our tune in terms of the comparison of kind of fabric first or uh heat pump first and we always used to say get the fabric done because then you'll have this really low load and you can make the system work really efficiently and now we're saying it's just not happening at the speed we need to we need to just get on and get the heat pumps in and to get them working efficiently we generally need more um, radiators when it comes or kind of outputs whatever it is we need greater surface area so that we can have that lower flow when it comes to new buildings we just need to be designing in the same way we just need to be getting those temperatures down and taking anything off the system that means that it has to run harder or at higher temperatures Jose, are you, yeah. you're in New York, correct, you said? Uh, I work with projects in New York, but I'm, I'm in the UK, I'm in London. So okay. I've been, I've, I've seen the difference between living in New York and living in the UK, at least, you know, what, what people use or what the comfort level is, because to me, it's also a comfort, a personal or cultural comfort threshold, because it seems like people are more comfortable in cold, with like two degrees Celsius less than you normally be if you're from America. I mean, I'm, I'm from Panama, so I'm not, I'm, I'm usually like 30 something degree weather in general, but the difference in comfort, what the code says comfort is, it's it's a big thing. And I guess that's why in Europe and the UK, you didn't really uh, pilot using heat pumps or a lot of heating in buildings. I think we just, we had really cheap gas for a long time. So, you know, it's kind yeah, of, that too, yeah. It's yeah, quite so interesting, I'll, the cultural difference. Yeah. Yeah, I'll quickly share again from here. I think uh, David Mickey also just said it in the, in the chat. So um, unfortunately, where we are, is, it was actually super easy. This is not the unfortunate part, but it was very easy to switch to a heat pump. Um, it's just a matter of two days um, because we have a forced air system. They just take the, the conventional furnace out and put where otherwise we would have had an air conditioner. They add the heat pump coil in. Unfortunately, we're not able to, or this is the, the popular uh, opinion, we're not able to get rid of the furnace because on the coldest days here where we can have minus 25 and under uh, degrees Celsius, we still need backup heating. My uh, heat pump is only set up to run until about minus 10 degrees or so. And so underneath that, you need to pick up with uh, a furnace I know that it's designed to run down to minus 15 and I'm going to push it there eventually, but my HVAC company may not like it because of warranties and such, but I'm experimenting the, with that myself. So I'm, yeah, we are stuck with using mainly electricity and we still have a gas service. And also my um, hot water is still also just being done with, with gas. So going fully electric is possible but you're definitely being very courageous in, in our area here. That's yeah, really yeah, interesting. Yeah. No, I mean, you're, oh, you're right. It's, hey, I, go ahead. I think also like what our ultimate aims are with this. There's some points where, um, where actually you think is for dealing with those extreme scenarios that actually over the course of year the year is a very small amount of energy that that which I don't know that's what I'm assuming so it's kind of I guess that that's what I would want to do is to do the assessment and say is this something that we should really worry about or is it totally fine and actually the heat pump is doing the lion's share of the work and it's only on those very cold days when actually there may be quite a loading on the grid anyway so that might be the point where using the gas is is a fairly reasonable thing to do um yeah yeah 
Uh, I mean, it, it's a great conversation. And, and I think we should have a one-on-one -on, -one on this specifically. Uh, and imagine the complication to having to, well, imagine the complication of most people that don't really understand this stuff, even just the basics of building science to try to think about it, you know, ahead of time when they are building or retrofitting a project. So yeah, there's there's a lot of education required just to understand these systems. Um, so yeah, I mean, I I do I would like to go to our I think it's one more question, and then we can continue the conversation if yet if somebody else would like to jump in. Um, this one's moving away from the mechanical uh, side of the presentation to the more practical one. Um, is Richard Gardner on the call? So he can ask his question. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for recognizing my question. Yeah, um, you you talked about the um, solar heat gain coefficient and maybe not taking an advantage of it at all. And I was wondering if there's any guidance that, you know, yeah, is there a way to exploit it? Because um, it is very helpful, I guess, if used appropriately, but. Just wondering if you have any guidance on how to balance not using it versus using it, but still not jeopardizing the localized overheating you are talking about. Yeah, I guess so, so. There is still some benefit to it, and just going back to particularly looking, the solar gains in the winter time are not zero, um, but. I think that there, what I've seen in a lot of passive house design and also the passive solar design that's kind of that came before it is a slight, slight obsession, both with orientating buildings so that they only, uh, you know, kind of this whole thing of like, oh, I can't build a passive house because uh, our plot is orientated the wrong way, which was just like, what on earth is that? Like, that's balmy. Um, and also that... Um, this requirement for us to have large windows to the south and small windows to the north to try and um, optimize the amount of solar gain. When you look at the embodied energy involved in glass and the cost of glass, then actually the savings you get in terms of the uh, the offsetting, the free free heat that we get, it turns out is not very free at all. This is stuff which we have to pay for. So let alone there's the solar, the summer comfort issues, which um, there is a kind of highlighted, which to me is one of the key drivers for us to be thinking about this, but actually just looking at the um, the kind of economics or the environmental impact of us having an awful lot of glass on the south side, when we weigh that up against the benefits we get in terms of the savings, it doesn't look too healthy. So this is kind of that whole thing about being really careful about where we draw like the boundary around whatever it is that we're talking around. So if you're just looking at the heating energy and looking at maybe a graph from a PHPP, then yeah, it looks like optimizing the solar gain and trying to have, um, trying to get those windows bigger to do that seems like a really good thing, but that's not taking account of the capital cost and the, um, the embodied energy. Once you start to take those into consideration, then actually the, you know, it, it starts to fall apart. So I think it's just asking for us to have a bit of a wider look at this and kind of look at the environmental impact overall and ultimately we need to i think the thing that i find most difficult is how it's related to the aesthetic of the building and i think that this is uh where i would really like us to be uh designing differently um so that we were really trying to create um spaces inside that worked as really nice spaces and that should be our primary aim um, and ultimately the passive house standard is all about comfort and so that's why I've given this the kind of comfort angle here that's what I'm particularly interested in um, but it's uh, it's still yeah it's quite controversial um, as an opinion okay. yeah I, I like to jump in on that one um, just to add a little bit more to Richard's question I mean I think you should definitely exploit the SHGC but I think it goes tied into your energy model because sometimes you have to find a sweet spot on what works for you and the building. If you're, I guess, working with PHP or some other model that takes into account the solar heating coefficient. Uh, and just one thing out of experience is that, you know, here in the UK, at least in London, um, I've been paying a lot of attention to that because obviously you live in retrofits that they just have one orientation and you're stuck with it. You can't really choose. Um, <clears throat> and I, I, and I am currently, I've been in two buildings that are South facing, but 
the point of getting the heat gain, it's null when you don't get the sun over the winter. So you just end up getting all the free heat when it's already hot outside. So it's really important to keep uh, to keep in mind your context and the climate situation in your area. Uh, before I'm not just sure going I totally just agree with that. It. Like I think there's yeah. um we don't there is um for the UK we get about um the solar radiation is about fifty percent through diffuse and fifty percent direct over the winter. It changes over the summertime. It's a lot more direct. Though well, I say a lot more. It's from a fairly low starting bar. So those um we still. I I think that in terms of the calculations, it still is easy to design something with um, with a lot of glass and that in terms of the heating energy that looking pretty good, but I think it comes with real problems um, and uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah no, that, that's that's a that's a valid comment for sure and um, yeah I guess it all depends on experience I mean right now I'm learning. And as I see things happening, then I'll be learning what not to do. But, you know, in general, as a rule of thumb, it's good to keep everything in mind when you're including your glazing areas, for sure. Uh, just doing triple pain in, in a good SHGC is important as a baseline. But then, yeah, definitely taking account the model and your specific uh, exposure to radiation. You know, that's, that's a big thing. I didn't know about the window turning into a radiator because of all the sun that's soaking up, right? You want to take the heat gain out, but you still have a very hot, uh, you know, piece of glass with gas. So I guess that that's the valid point there, you know, keep in mind that that could happen and you can't really account for it until it does. Yeah, we yeah, were really is... surprised because we were looking at the um, on this project, we were looking at the monitoring and we were saying there's not a problem in this room. We don't know what the issue is. And so that was a real this this thing here was a a it was yeah we'd never come across this kind of thing before in to this extent like we kind of knew it was a problem but to have it particularly here as I said this is a very well designed school so whilst it had a lot of south facing glazing what you can't see is that there's a really massive overhang here unfortunately it's directly the photo is taken at the wrong angle but it's it's like 1.8 meters wide so it's big um yeah sorry I talked over someone then yeah, this home is in um, a FIA certified build in climate zone 2A. And, you know, if we, it's my actual single family um, home residence. And, you know, if we dial up the solar heat gain coefficient to 0.6, it solves everything. But, you know, that's unrealistic. Um, and we kind of doubt it down to 0.35. That's kind of the balance of not exploiting it completely. But I'm still nervous about the overheating. Um, localized overheating, and I'm not sure how, you know, if that's not really modeled too well in, in, in Wolfie Passive from what I can tell. Yeah, that's a really great point, Richard. I guess I'm not saying to don't use it and disregard it in terms of the heating load, but yeah, it's exactly that. I, I do think it's really difficult to come up with something that is, um, particularly if you're having a, um, if you don't put cooling into um, the building, that gap between for those extremities and feeling comfortable with that, I think is is incredibly difficult to manage. I have one more question from Mary. And Mary, if you're still on the phone, I would love to invite you to, to jump in and ask. Otherwise, I am happy to ask it for you. Give it a quick second. It looks like she left the call. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and, and ask for Mary then. Uh, so Sally, are radiators needed in a well-designed passive house? And what other sources of secondary heating would be useful? Oh, that's a good one. So um, the, we definitely need some heat going into our buildings, uh, into a passive house, because if we tried to design it so that it needed no heat at all, then um, the we would the kind of extremities about where the if the temperature fell slightly in comparison to the modeling or if um, the internal gains if the number of people if say my son left home uh, if any of these things happened then there's no kind of um, capacity to take up the variation 
um, in terms of either the weather or it might just be that I go through a spell of like wanting to turn the ventilation up because I'm not very good at cleaning my house I don't know so there's all kinds of things that of human behavior sorry Keith you look very shocked by that um, that uh like the way that we behave, um, that we want to take account of, and we want to give our building some flexibility um, so that there isn't, we're not being kind of properly laying down the law and saying how people use the particular building. We want them to have that opportunity for the range. And us putting some heating in the building allows for that variation. It allows for the climate to change from one year to the other, um, all kinds of things. So we definitely want some heating going in. Now, I've talked about radiators, but it could just as well be underfloor heating or to a certain extent, you know, it could be air heating. It could be any of these things. Those are other options that are there. Um, and there are kind of pros and cons of them. I would say that as long as we are, um, if we're connecting two heat pumps, as long as we're trying to get the temperature, the sink temperature that it's like, so the, the temperature that it's raising up to as low as possible, then we're going to be in a good position. Um, and beyond that, the efficiency of those, um, the, uh, the things that are giving out the heat, radiators, underfloor, whatever else, doesn't really matter that much. Beyond that, it's totally fine. Interesting. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Sally. Um, we have one more question from Kendall. Is Kendall on the line? On the call? Mm -hmm. I can ask the question for him or her. Can you hear me? This is Kendall. Hey, go ahead. Thank you. Hi. I, I'm sorry I was trying to make my question more concise, but uh, uh, we've built passive houses uh, beginning in 2012, and now we build store, sort of a uh, a uh, uh, very tight, well insulated house, but it's not to passive house standard. Um, these are just single family new construction homes with slab on grade uh, insulated slabs. Uh, I'm curious about putting some of that ambient heat from the passive solar gain back into the radiant slab through using a heat pump water heater. Right now we use uh, uh, an electric boiler to heat the slab. Um, and that's, it's really, it's not very cost effective. The output temps on that tend to go up around 180 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and because the slab is only intended to be you know, around 80 or 90 degrees Fahrenheit. It just seems like it's not an efficient process. So I'm just curious about any thumbnail thoughts that that uh, you might have on the, the smartness of, of using the uh, heat pump water heater for that purpose. Yeah, thank you, Kendall. Um, it, so yes, it's a really good thing because um, particularly if you have got a very well insulated and well built home that again in even in comparison to the flow temperatures that we we're talking about for our uh, radiators if you're dealing with underfloor heating you should be able to get it to uh, like five ten degrees centigrade I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit uh, lower in temperature so it means your heat pump is going to be doing even better than it would be if it was connected to radiators and alternative um, we don't tend to a lot of the projects we do are very tight on money and so we we don't tend to do it because it's an extra expense it's quite a lot more money to go for underfloor heating but there might be other benefits for your particular project uh, that mean that underfloor heating is a good solution so um yeah i definitely think it's a it, it's it would make a you know phenomenal difference and as you saw like we should be able to um, get their the heating energy if they're dealing with their um, if your current homes are they're paying for that with direct electricity and as you said the controllability of it is kind of quite tricky then um, the likelihood is that we should be able to cut that by at least a third by slipping uh, by changing over to a heat pump does that does that answer your question Kendall um, yes yes thank you All righty, I have one over here from Angus Funkhauser. Angus, are you still online? Would you like to ask your question? 
How's it going? Yes, I am. Um, yeah, I was just wondering um, kind of where your critique to uh, the passive solar design came from and if you could, if there are like any um, methods maybe um, or mitigation measures that might like make those viable because I feel like they're like a good starting point um, and something that if you just ignore or um, avoid, you're really missing out on um, some potential advantages. Um, so like you mentioned the school, like um, that might be like uh, like a design flaw, maybe not enough shading or total solar um, so thermal mass. Um, but anyway, so I was wondering if there was any like mitigation. I, yeah, might, might uh, yeah, it's fine. a really good question because, um, and I think that it's been quite interesting, the, like this is the thing which, uh in terms of my consultancy and also the training that has the biggest resistance is like it feels like I'm taking away the architect's toys by saying actually you need to have less glass on this building and it is the one thing that I have been kicked off two projects for saying as well over my career is uh just saying that I didn't want to uh do these projects because unless they change the amount of glass and I've got one which at the moment is definitely hanging in the balance where um, they've got an office building with windows that are 4.5 meters high so kind of you know very very tall windows um, so it's and it's completely coated uh, on this particular floor so I think it's um it's a really difficult one. It's a really, um, there's so much that, and I've had every single um, reason for having floor to ceiling glass kind of thrown at me in terms of like, oh, well, the kid's like lying on the floor and looking out the window and, oh, well, you know, this is a very tall building. So you need to have a view down to the street level. And there is, um, in there there are some truths but it's the extent of it I guess is that to me it feels like we um we my experience of going and visiting these schools and these homes and these buildings where there is too much glass it feels uncomfortable you know what we're handing over to the occupants I think is um I don't think it's acceptable. And to me, I don't want to work on buildings anymore where it doesn't feel like it's actually creating comfort. And I've done quite a lot of modeling to look at um, the uh, opportunities to kind of mitigate this, as you say, and definitely things like external shutters and things like that can be really beneficial. But ultimately they still have, um, they still fail they still require either occupants to do something or mechanical things to do stuff. It's really problematic. And this particular, what's so interesting about this particular school, as I said, the shading was really significant. We are, um, we would not be able to build a school with that much shading on now that we just couldn't afford it. Um, and what was happening was that the, the glass, nearly all of it was shaded. It was only at a particular point in time, the very bottom section of the glass that was heating up, that was getting a tiny bit of radiation hitting it directly. And then what happened within the panes the cavities of the glass we were getting a convection current that was going up and around and it was spreading that heat so that the whole glass was hot so this is something where if you want to shade it you have to make sure all of the glass is shaded all the time and so you can see the example that I gave where they had the uh, the blue plastic shading on the outside that basically just took away any view of outside altogether that was the only thing that is actually going to provide that level of shading so it's tricky it's really hard and I guess that this is something where there are um within this there's um I'm presenting this as a really kind of black and white case but at the same time there is there may be some particular scenarios where full height glazing is really appropriate and the best solution I guess what I'm trying to say is we just need to um we really need to see it as like the special stuff and not just throw it at our buildings. But yeah, there isn't, I haven't found lots of mitigation. I mean, you know, techie solutions, it's just a disaster. You just don't want to go there. Okay, so your problem is with like over glazing and not necessarily with passive house or passive solar design. Is that 
would that be yeah well i think that I often i've seen passive solar design leading to more glass being put on a building than would have otherwise so i guess that's the angle that's particularly problematic from my side is like it's in the name of passive house which i'm like this is not that's not what we're trying to do we're trying to make somewhere really comfortable and ultimately we end up with a problem that's very very difficult for us to solve so yeah, sorry, I didn't quite get your question, but yes, it's it's very much about the this must be passive house, so therefore overglazing. Now we've had lots of reasons why buildings are overglazed, but yeah, that particular one really wrangles with me. It's hard to uh, combat the people who are yeah. driven by aesthetics with that too, because I mean, if you know, glass looks great, <laughs> it looks great until you're inside. There was, uh, I was just talking to um, a client who works on a lot of multifamily uh, apartment complexes and there's one that they've, I'm in Portland, Oregon, and they've kind of just built it a couple of years ago. So they have residents now. And if you drive, this is mostly in the summer and, you know, kind of that five, five o'clock hour. But if you drive uh, on their west side, they're, they're facing the west. Everyone has either a blanket that they've hung because it's just floor to ceiling glass. Or they've bought, I, some people bought um, an emergency blanket, those like really foily ones, and they taped that up to block the light. So, you know, it's an expensive apartment complex too. <laughs> yeah, I mean, glass makes it, you know, you can make really I think this whole, the difference between art and architecture, I think is something that is um, definitely we do a lot of uh, in the training and also in the consultancy trying to really pull those things apart because I do think it's it's really problematic and ultimately we need buildings which are both beautiful but also are really nice to be inside and that is it's just it's so depressing isn't it Sarah seeing those things where you think this is totally avoidable so yeah yeah I, I hear you I hear you, all of you when, when you're commenting about glass. I mean, I my background is mostly in fenestrations and high performance facades and selling European windows. And I found both where they don't have enough glass and they have way too much glass. And you can never really find a sweet spot on the architectural side. So um, I'm just glad we're having the conversation and you're pointing out all of the specifics you should keep in mind. I think that is the key, regardless of what you're trying to do, to be honest. As long as you have context and you have... Uh, I guess, educated conversation and that drives your design. I believe that it should be a good building. It will probably end up being a Frankenstein building when the users are actually making it work. But it's good to have a good base. And I think this conversation brings that based on what you've uh, explained and what Angus uh, commented on for sure. Thank you for bringing that question on. Um, so we have one more question from David Water or Walter, if he's on the line, uh, go go on and, and go ahead with the question. Hi, I'm here. Thank you, Sally, very much for the presentation. It was excellent. Really enjoyed it. Um, I'm going to swing back to heat pumps. Uh, in a retrofit, have you ever tested the heat pump to make sure that the COP was performing to what it, the specifications? And if so, how did you verify the thermal envelope of the building other than modeling? Uh, so um i have to admit i've got limited experience of the uh, very specific case you're talking about so uh this is so colleagues of mine have that are um, part of our training group have done quite a lot of this and also two of them have put them in in their houses one which has been pretty horrendous and one which has been incredibly good and uh the inter um the one that was very good, I think this is where also, because the sizing is so critical, that going through the po process of certification can be incredibly helpful to give that context of si getting the sizing right for the building and making sure that what the prediction, the, we can size a heat pump and be confident that it's actually going to achieve what we want it to. So I would say that that 
is um, that's a really crucial part, as you say, is understanding the thermal performance of the building is really helpful. So having a, a good strategy for that, and particularly if you're doing a retrofit, then, you know, Enerfit is the gold standard for that. Having someone to go through and pick through every single thing that you've done and give you that confidence that it's there. Um, predominantly, the kind of key things, though, are stuff like the assumed air tightness of the building is obviously makes a massive difference to the building. So I would say that that is um, for heat pump design and also for the install, particularly of retrofit, uh, getting that down and having it tested and making sure that that is goes into the calculations for the heat pump is really the number one thing. If you can't do anything else, do that one. And also while you're at it, you might as well seal a few of those holes. So that's the most crucial one. As I said, the performance has been very varied um, and there, uh, a lot of it, there are like any system, there's kind of gremlins within it. So trying to get those, uh, trying to uh, work out the specifics of why the performance is not working or is working um, is, always challenging but kind of mind blend bending if you're interested in that kind of thing but as i said we have had examples where it's worked very well and uh the systems that have worked well have tended to be ones which are relatively simple and um are easy to understand and are less likely to have uh complex things that are going to go wrong okay um thank you <laughs> uh, cheers david Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, David. Uh, so I think that is a wrap. Uh, please, you know, come join us for Source 2050 and the Component Spotlight tomorrow at 12 p.m. And we will see you all. That's 12 p.m. Eastern. Uh, so we will see you all in the next one. And thank you to Sally and everyone that joined. Thanks, Jose. Have a good, uh, have a good day. <laughs>